test mic. Test mic, one, two, three, mic test. Hello class, to my intermission students, thank you for taking your time to listen and to uh, learn about our discussion today. Now, uh, last meeting, we had learned about mission and theology of religions. So we talked about the task of mission, we talked about uh, secularization, we talked about uh, mission priority, especially to the world religions, to the unrich, to the non-Christians, and specifically to the 1040 window. So we had learned about how uh, was this uh, the relationship between uh, religions in terms of our mission worldwide. Now, this uh, today, we will be learning about cultural anthropology and mission. We will uh, explore what is the essence of knowing about uh, culture, knowing about anthropology and how this is relevant in doing our mission. So cultural anthropology provides conceptual tools and research me methods that are very helpful in missions. So knowing uh, how to do cultural anthropology is very much effective because these are tools and these are research methods that can be very useful in doing missions. This is not to say that Christians should adopt all presuppositions behind all, uh, all anthropology or any other social science. So in the interest of maintaining the primacy of scriptural principles, anthropology must be used critically and selectively. So it doesn't mean that we have to use all presuppositions uh, regarding anthropology or other related uh, social science, but yet we have to decipher, we have to, to know what uh, was this uh, type of anthropology that we will be using and that we will be selective and uh, we'll be able to, to, to decipher what is effective. So this chapter discusses some selected concepts and methods that are useful in cross-cultural mission. If you want to have a detailed explanation about anthropology, you can see the works of Paul Hebert, Charles Kraft, uh, Brian Howell, or Janelle Paris and others. So anthropology has five subfields. So what are these uh, subfields? Number one, we have physical or biological anthropology. We have archeology. span uh, We have linguistics. We have cultural anthology and then applied anthropology. So physical biology or anthropology studies human origins and is controversial for creationists because of its evolutionary approach. That's physical for, for archeology. span We know archeology, span most of it is in terms with ancient cultures, we, 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 we dig. It is useful for the roots of contemporary cultures and the multiple cultures of uh, biblical times, right? And then we have linguistic and the word language the study of the use of language in a way that broadens the understanding of cultures and is very helpful for Bible translation. We have Hebrew, we have Greek, we have Aramaic, we have Latin, okay? So we have a cultural anthology also. Cultural anthology focuses on all of the dimensions of cultural groups. And finally, we have applied anthropology and this is where we would be going through. So it is, it specializes in doing field research in the service of specific endeavors such as uh, Christian missions. So in this book, anthropology refers to cultural anthropology rather than to the broad discipline of anthropology with its different uh, branches. So Howell and Paris define uh, cultural anthropology such as, such as this. It's the description, interpretation, and analysis of similarities and differences in human cultures. Now, uh, this definition highlights the value of cultural anthropology for missions. Now, cultures are so similar and are so different at the same time, right? 
So having a deep understanding of particular um, niche, particular culture would greatly assist us in doing mission. Anthropology and sociology are closely related social sciences with different perspectives and approaches. So sociologists have uh, historically studied Western societies. So for, 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 for sociologists, uh, they would do quantitative research method, methods. And we, we, we all know what is quantitative, right? It's about uh, data uh, survey and analysis using computer programs and producing numerical results. That, that's sociology using quantitative method. And we have the anthropologist. So the anthropologists have historically studied non-Western peoples favoring qualitative methods. So under qualitative methods, we have uh, interviews, participant observation, other methods, perhaps uh, like a lived experience of the individual. So anthropology is particularly valuable for Christian missions because of its focus on the other person, gender, culture, social group, ethnic group, language group, economic group, religious group, are all the others who are our neighbors. So this is uh, the essence of uh, uh, anthropology. It is very much valuable because it uh, studies uh, the different facets of a person, especially with also with uh, the, the, the environment. Now, anthropologists are more likely to study cross-culturally than sociologists. Christians can rely on anthropology more to understand the relationship between gospel and culture at home and uh, abroad. Uh, anthropology is basically the study of men. So anthropology is a systematic study of the other, whereas all the other social disciplines are in one sense or another studies of self. Now, uh, what are the cultural, what are the contributions of cultural and anthropology for missions? Okay. So let's take a look at this, uh, the contributions of anthropology in uh, doing missions. First is it offers a holistic or comprehensive approach to the study of human beings. Okay, so anthropology, uh, it's all about men. So it's a holistic comprehensive study of human beings. So anthropology study humans, both genders, you have age groups, uh, from different geographical location, you have uh, from different ethnicity, uh, every economic and social status, every religion. So anthropology is interested in both the differences between people and the universal commonalities shared by humanity. What do all people from everywhere think? Uh, how do they feel? How do they uh, live their lives? Okay. So how does thinking, feeling, and doing differ, differ from different groups? So understanding this diversity and commonality of people is extremely helpful in missions as it conforms to the biblical portrayal of humanity. The Bible names Adam and Eve as the parents of all humanity, but also records its wide uh, diversity. So let's proceed to uh, number two. Number two is culture concept itself. So number one is about people, okay? Studying, studying the diversity of people from, from different perspective. And second, studying culture. So what is culture? According to Paul Hebert, he said that culture is the more or less integrated systems of ideas, feelings, and values, and their associated patterns of behavior and products shared by a group of people who organize and regulate what they feel, think, and do. So the second contribution of anthropology to mission is the culture itself. For example, uh, the people of Asia, Africa, or European ancestry who lives in, uh, what's this, uh, in Canada, okay, they may have, what's this, they may have more, much, much more in common than those people who are back in their ancestral lands. So, Asians, Americans alike, okay, if they are in Canada, so they have much more in common because they are situated in one place than for those people who are back at their countries. So until the culture concept was developed, skin color and bone culture were thought to be reliable indicators of essential human attributes. So uh, now Charles Craft also 
uh, explains culture such as like a uh, child who is born to this world. Now he functions uh, effectively, okay? Uh, as he is uh, born to this world by uh, the how he was brought up with the people that is around him or her. So eventually uh, the appropriate things that he sees and he does becomes embod emboldened in the person. So by the time we become aware of what's going on, we have already been pressed by the, by the time uh, the child is already aware of what is going on, he is already pressed to the cultural mold of his environment. Now, Howell and Paris would uh, describe this succinctly with this. Uh, they said that culture is a total way of life of a group of people that is learned, adaptive, shared, and integrated. So you have there uh, the words learned, verbs such as learned, uh, to adapt, shared, and to have an integral form. Now, uh, this are, we, we also have metaphors of culture too. So for us to be able to understand uh, what culture is like, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's just take a look at these metaphors. Now, now, every metaphor fits culture well, but in some ways, not so well with the other ways, okay? I repeat this. Every metaphor fits culture well in some ways, but not so well in other ways. So much can be learned about culture by thinking about this metaphor. Number one, culture as water or river. So the water metaphor implies that you know, the fish lives in water. So every human being lives also in culture. And we cannot live without culture, but maybe we can be unaware of being a creature of, of culture. But after all, the fish does not know that it lives in water. Like the fish does not know it lives in water unless their perspective is broadened. People think their way of life, sometimes we think that our way of life is only normal. It's natural. It's the proper way to live. The river metaphor implies that everyone is moving with a cultural current. River metaphor, when you are in a river, you, you, you move with a current. So some beliefs at the center, some beliefs at the side, while others swim against the current. But then this metaphor do not really fit culture completely because the fish cannot change the water, but people can do change their culture as they interact with them. So this metaphor doesn't really fit culture completely because you know the fish cannot really change water, but we people, we can change our culture as we interact uh, with them. Second, culture as a lens. So the lens or spectacles metaphor makes it clear that everyone has a particular view of reality. Like each of us has our own perspective. Each of us has our own uh, sight. So the metaphor suggests the need for one to consider and value how others perceive reality and not to think that one's own view is necessarily the best. Like we have to consider that our view is just from our own perspective. We also have to consider how others would see it in their own eyes. So this metaphor is inaccurate in the sense that the cultural filters are fixed and unchanging. Like for example, kind of antipara, uh, the, the lens, right? The spectacle lens. It implies that it's already fixed. So you have the grade for its lens. So it's already fixed and it's unchanging. Now, third is culture as rules of a game or as a map. What is the importance of a rule in a game or a map? How do we use it? We use it as a direction. We use it as a guide. But these metaphors are weak because they suggest that culture is unchanging because the rules is rules. You're gonna, you're gonna change it. The guide is a guide, the map is a map rather than culture, which is dynamic and changing. Uh, fourth, culture as an onion. You know an onion, right? Onion has different layers. You have the center, you have another layer, another layer. Uh, the onion metaphor illustrates that the culture has many, has many levels from shallow to deep. So the shallow, okay, the shallow, includes behavior, material products, and going to the deeper part is our values and beliefs. At the center of that is the worldview, the core, the deepest assumption, what 
uh, life really is and how it works. So later on, we will study more about uh, what, what worldview is. Fifth, culture as conversation. And how will Antares favors this metaphor because it is understood in this way. Culture is not so much a thing that people have as it is an activity that they do. It's not a thing that we have, but it's an activity that we do because culture is a practice like, like conversation. Culture is practiced dynamically by individuals we interact with others. We, we give, we receive inputs, we, we adjust to the unfolding relationships. So individuals shape their own conversations and outcomes. So just as a conversation is never repeated in exactly the same way when, when, when you meet someone, so the same is true with, with culture. And let's take a look now at, so we have these metaphors of culture, culture as water, culture as lens, a rules or game as an onion or conversation. So we, we, we now have like a, a bite of what culture is. So let's take a look at the characteristics of culture. There are 16 characteristics here. I will not be going into uh, the very much detail with this. You can read that later in, in the chapter. So first is a society is a culture in action. It's like a drama, like we serve as the actors and then our director whom we are following is the culture. So it's an action. There's an interaction that is going on. There's a protagonist, there's the, the, the antagonist, there's the, the, the going up and the going down, the conflict and the resolution. So it's like a drama. Second is culture is a total way of life, okay? Cultural concept use culture as embracing every aspect and dimension. So in, in the anthropological view, an illiterate person who wears nothing has just as much culture as a highly educated person who plays the violin in the symphony. So an, outside, an outsider may view the illiterate as having a simple culture when in fact it is very complex in its own way. So it's a, it's a way of life. We cannot really judge uh, you know, uh, the other person because uh, we don't know uh, the, 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 the background of, of that person. So deep down, there are many things that is happening. So it's, it's, it's a way of life, okay? Uh, we have uh, one culture, we cannot say that one, one, one is more culture than the other. All right. Now, third is culture is created and shared by members of a group. Okay. Culture, by definition, is something that belongs to a group of individual. Whether we like it or not, we belong to a group. Okay. So culture is a group. So broadly speaking, we conform to our culture. We conform to the group. We act because you know, we, 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 we belong to a group. We, we are being influenced by, by the environment, by, by the group. Next is culture has a cognitive and intellectual dimension, okay? Every culture has a connective dimension or a body of knowledge that is used in life. Traditional people, the illiterate ones, they would transmit information before like orally. Uh, those who are practicing a medicine, okay? Uh, folk medicine, they have this knowledge about diseases, detailed knowledge about diseases and cures about this. We have traditional sailors uh, they don't have uh, the GPS that we are having right now. They use uh, traditional methods to, nav to navigate distance using instruments. But then <coughs> modernity has increased available knowledge. We have the influx of, of printing, of uh, digital storage, amount knowledge has, has increased. So ancestral spirits are also really real in some cultures, but mere superstitions in, in others. Okay, like, like for the Buddhists, uh, they believe about ancestral uh, spirits, that they are real, they are alive. But some uh, cultures, uh, we believe that these are just, uh, you know, they believe that they are just superstitions. So even in the age of printing and internet, there are many illiterate or semi-illiterate living with oral traditions. So we still have this, we call this a folk traditions, folk uh, religion, though we are living in a modern age, yet uh, these folk beliefs, these uh, ancestral belief still uh, lingers. And we have uh, culture has an affective emotional dimension. Okay, so every human being experiences the same basic emotions. We love, right? We hate, we, sometimes we are sad, we struggle. Okay, now culture shapes and regulates how basic human emotions are felt and expressed. And there are also uh, warm and uh, cool cultures. So we have our basic emotions and we have cool cultures. These cool cultures are emotions that we prefer to be expressed with 
reserve and understatement. Okay, so kulang, it's reserve, it's understatement. And we also have warm cultures. These are, we enjoy strong expression of emotions and often use hyperbole or overstatement. So these are the two parts of, you have a basic emotions. We have uh, our cool culture, a bit of reserve understatement, and we have a warm culture, which is much more uh, confident, much more aggressive. Okay, we have overstatement or uh, hyperbole. And we have culture as evaluative, moral, and ethical dimensions. We have three words, moral, ethical, evaluative. So every culture evaluates what is true or false, right? What is right or wrong, what is beautiful or ugly. Each culture has its own moral code and its own culturally defined sins. So the highest values, primarily allegiance and main goals of life are defined. So we have our own set of moral college culture. We have our set of uh, moral standards. Some cultures highly value community, but some cultures also values individualism. Like for example, you know, the Western culture, right? Now values are collected into values of sets. So thus Filipinos, Russians, Congolese may share. We may share some of these values, but yeah, we have some commonalities, though we are in different culture, yet we have some commonalities, yet our culture remains unique. And we also have the Bible teaches eternal values that offer the best possible life for all cultures. We have universal biblical values such as love, mercy, justice, purity, gratefulness, fidelity. So every culture has some values that are affirmed by the scripture. And lastly, uh, number eight, culture is manifested by material products. Okay, so uh, these uh, material uh, products like, uh, what's this? Ah, there is still another one. Culture is manifested by behaviors. Okay, so from childhood, we grow up as adolescent, we, go, we, 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 we were raised, we get married. So in formal settings like weddings or funerals, correct behavior is uh, carefully defined. Okay, so in less formal setting like daily life, there is also a greater range of permissible behavior. And special meanings sometimes are attached to behavior. For example, we have a gestures. So we, in Thai, you have this gesture, meaning respect. It can also be a greeting. In, in, in India, when you say no, it should be like that. That's their no. And their yes is like this, okay? And some other cultures, it is not acceptable if you point your foot, okay, to their sacred things. It is detestable, okay? So uh, that's uh, culture is like. And uh, last is culture is manifested by material products. So the range of objects used at home, work, or play is almost infinite. You have traditional uh, societies that have relatively few products. And you have a modern industrial societies which has greater material products. We have this architecture. We have uh, paintings, right? We have these cultural products that is expressed. So this, uh, this cultural products has some cultural meaning. Okay, so you have this, uh, how do you call it, statue, okay? And you have this inscription, all right? And you have these paintings that has cultural uh, meaning. And then culture organizes and regulates as people group. Number nine. From culture, we have different uh, people groups, all right? Uh, culture tells every individual at every age of life and in every position in society of how, what how we think, how we express things, and how we behave. So culture assigns particular status. Culture defines penalties for non-compliance. So from this culture, we have different groupings, such in, in the Hindu culture, you have the caste system, you have the Brahmin, you have the Kshatriya, you have the Shudras or the untouchables, okay? And you have different tribes, you have different clubs, different parliaments, you have different societies. And this, in one culture, has this different, uh, uh, was this sub people group. And culture is also both learned and created, right? Uh, even before birth, babies hear speech and music and sense emotions that start the process of cultural formation. So the teaching is both planned and planned, formal and informal. While people learn and absorb their culture, possibly we, like a sponge, they also make active individual contributions. For example, we, 
I go to a certain place, though I am a minority, yet, uh, yes, uh, I, I may be influenced by the, the majority because of the culture where I am, yet in the same way, I may be also able to, to influence them, okay? And then culture is also patterned. The behaviors, ideas, and products of culture are grouped together into patterns called cultural traits or customs. So we, we can see this pattern in, in cultures, like for food, we have our own distinct food, okay? Like for Filipinos, uh, we have this uh, manopo, okay? So this, is, this has become a pattern. And, and, and was this uh, coming from uh, when we were colonized by, 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 by Spain? Okay, so you can see this pattern in, in different culture and you'll be able to distinguish a culture by, by its pattern. Culture is also integrated. Culture is an integrated system, not a random assortment of quaint customs, ideas, behavior patterns, material products are related to one another as cultural traits and these are linked to each other in broader patterns called cultural configuration. So culture is interrelated, okay? It is a relation of between ideas, you have behavior patterns, you have the material products, how we relate to one another, okay? And uh, culture integration means that changing one part of culture potentially changes many other parts. So like for example, with the introduction of mobile phones and computers, so the, the, the worldwide culture had been just drastically, drastically changed. Right, and uh, it's becoming uh, modern. So how we communicate, uh, how 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 we do things, ha had changed. Okay, with the advent of of this uh, technology. Now, when Christians accept Jesus Christ, they adapt new values and lifestyle behavior that are integrated into their existing uh, culture. For example, when someone decided to stop drinking, okay. Uh, and uh, before he had been drinking for perhaps he believes that this would provide energy for him. It also provides work for the woman, uh, livelihood for the woman who, who do it. So drinking beer symbolizes hospitality and being part of the community. So when the person uh, stopped drinking, he becomes marginalized. He becomes uh, excommunicated by, by the community. So the newly convert Christian has to develop a new subculture and the new pattern of relating to the larger culture, okay? So culture is also dynamic and adaptive. Every culture on every continent in every age has faced constant change. So the idea of stable and changing culture in the past is a myth, whether voluntarily or by coercion, societies have adapted to changing natural, political, military, economic, and technological realities. Of course, we have the migration, we have the advent of technology, okay? So, so culture changes as time uh, goes on, okay? And uh, there are many facets uh, why uh, this had changed, yet it is dynamic, it is adaptive, it is changing. And culture also are in different trajectories, okay? Uh, what do we mean by this? Now, the Western societies were seen as being farther up the ladder than all other societies. So we have this Western and we have the non-Western uh, society. So they view that we have the higher society, we have the higher culture, and we also have the lower culture. So what they view is that the Western is the more dominant and the non-Western culture is much more uh, subsequent. But yet it should not be like this because though how immature we, we, cannot, thus, we, cannot, we cannot say that African or Asian societies were an immature version of the Western culture. But this is a mature manifestation of cultures moving in different directions, okay? So we have a different trajectory. It doesn't mean that one culture is dominant upon, upon the other or one culture is subsequent from another. We, we go through a different uh, trajectories because culture is unique, okay? Now, uh, culture are small core and large core, okay? And this is basically, uh, was this referring to uh, marginalized, uh, was this in the um, least 
merge, uh, was it, sorry, it's a least evangelized and uh, evangelized countries. So uh, the small core countries, they have, uh, was this, they have a prevalent uh, attitude that is much more common in them. So it is just small because they have, uh, uh, was this uh, low uh, elements that uh, they do agree with one another. But for large uh, core culture, they have so many differences, okay? They have so many uh, cultural traits that is different from one another. So we can refer to this as the small core as in the European society or, or the Western society. And we have the large core, which is basically in, in here in Asia, in African culture where there are plenty of tribes, okay? We have plenty of minorities, uh, there are plenty of people groups. Culture is also high context or low context, okay? In high context, people know each other well and can communicate effectively with few words and details. So in high context areas, okay, people can communi communicate effectively, even though you, 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 you just say a few words and you have this uh, action, yet everybody understands it. But in low context, people use many words and explanations to communicate effectively because of a diverse cultural context. So the same is true with, with was this, the same is true with uh, Western and Asia. In Western society, uh, they have, um, what's this, they are, they are much uh, broader. So uh, uh, they can just easily communicate with each other, especially with gesture and they can already understand. But for us Asians or Africans where there are plenty of tribes, okay? So we communicate uh, diversely from our, uh, what's this, uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds, okay? Now let's go to cultural, cross-cultural comparison. This is very much important. Why do we compare culture? A cultural comparison is very important that we may be, may be, may be able to understand, okay, uh, culture to culture. So the third, this is the third major contribution of the field of anthropology, okay? So what are those contributions? We have first is it offers holistic or comprehensive approach to the study of human beings as anthropology. And we have studied uh, culture, okay? Then third is to understand, okay, uh, is to understand the understanding of humankind is its use of method of cross-cultural comparison. So how do, we, how do we compare culture? And so you have here the different facets of it, cognitive, affective, evaluative, behavior, and then you have also products. Now, the challenges of cross-cultural comparison, it is very much challenging. Why? Because there are the differences between cultures are deep. That's number one. Number two, making accurate comparison is much difficult. Number three, the one making the comparison tends to use their own culture as the norm, okay? And we also have racism and uh, Ethnocentrism. What do you mean by racism and ethnocentrism? Uh, just recently, we have this Black Lives Matter. So it's the, what's this? Uh, uh, a black uh, person uh, died in, in the US. So uh, racism is a negative comparison based on others' race or physical features and ancestry. Okay, so we compare our race from the other and we look down on the other race. So that is racism. Ethnocentrism is a negative comparison based on others' ethnicity, which includes the multiple factors of ancestry, physical features, culture, language, and nationality. That's the concept of ethnocentrism includes racism, but goes further in identifying the sins of humanity against another. So uh, ethnocentrism is much more deep because you highlight uh, the wrongdoing of the other individual, okay? And then we have cultural stereotype. Of course, we already know what the stereotype is. It is stereotyping is over generalization, okay? So a cultural stereotype is generalization about a group of people that by nature tends to be preconceived 
and oversimplified. So when it's preconceived, it is only your own idea. Perhaps it is only your own prejudice, okay? And you oversimplify things. Stereotypes can reduce humans to mere caricatures of themselves. At worst, cultural stereotypes are racist and ethnocentric. So we have these uh, different types of, uh, what's this uh, example of stereotyping, like Western towards non-Westerns and non-Westerns toward Westerns. So more negative, like innocent, ignorant, uh, positive, for Westerns to non-Westerns, family-oriented. Uh, for, for, for the non-Westerns towards Westerners, negative is they are aggressive and they are well-educated, the more uh, positive. So you can take a look at that. Uh, those. So you have here lazy and crap, okay? And uh, have group harmony for the non-Westerners looking at uh, Westerners. Westerners are highly, harshly pragmatic and they are reliable, okay? So those are cultural stereotypes. You have negative and you have a positive, but I hope we would always look at uh, the positive. And you have cultural relativism. What is cultural relativism? Cultural relativism is the view that cultural practices and beliefs are best understood in, their, in relation to their entire context. Sometimes we may not understand things because we have uh, what's this very shallow uh, perspective but we have to understand this in its entirety. So elements of a particular culture may seem illogical or even offensive to those of another culture, but they must view it from their own historic, economic, political, religious context to be understood. For example, uh, men and women who are sitting in a church from different side, okay? In some societies, this is to show solidarity between those who are not married or widowed or, or divorced, okay? Because you, all the male here, all the female here, okay? So there are no other couples who are uh, sitting together. So in other societies, the norm is for parents and children to be able to sit together. So the missionary's task is to withhold judgment, to discern that internal history and logic through the process of faithful contextualization the beliefs and practice of a particular culture can be brought before the word of God to be affirmed or modified and abandoned. 